This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 4. Coming up on Space Time, new clues about mysterious fast radio bursts, underground Martian water ice deposits exposed, and the universe is far more massive stars than expected. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have prized free some new clues about those mysterious cosmic blasts known as fast radio bursts, finding they originate from an environment bathed in extreme magnetic fields. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are one of the most unusual phenomena in the universe today. They're extremely brief millisecond bursts of intense energy blasting across the universe over great cosmic distances. While the new findings were put in the journal Nature doesn't shed any new light into what causes them, the research has provided some new insights into the deep space environment in which they occur. The discovery suggests that these strange events probably occur within close proximity to a massive black hole, or alternatively, within a nebula of unprecedented power. Fast radio bursts are extremely rare, less than two dozen have been detected, and they usually only ever occur once at any given location in space. That tends to indicate that they're produced by some sort of cataclysmic process, a process which is destroying the very object that's generating them, probably a star exploding in a massive supernova event. Being so brief and so far away has made working out what's actually going on extremely difficult. And that's where fast radio burst FRB 121102 comes in. It's the only known fast radio burst which repeats. A year ago, astronomers were able to pinpoint its location to a star-forming region near the centre of a distant dwarf galaxy more than 3 billion light-years away. At this great distance, an enormous amount of energy is needed to power each burst, roughly as much energy is being released in a single millisecond as what the Sun releases in an entire day. As the only known repeating fast radio burst, FRB 121102, raises questions as to whether it has a different origin compared to apparently non-repeating FRBs. But it's also given astronomers a unique opportunity to try and study the phenomenon. To carry out their new observations, astronomers developed new setups at both the 305-metre Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico and the 100-metre Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia. The new setup allowed them to detect their fast radio bursts at far higher radio frequencies than ever before. A flash from FRB 121102 was then observed as it travelled towards the telescopes. The new technique allowed scientists to monitor how the properties of the burst changed with time. The burst shows a complicated structure with multiple bright peaks. Now, these could be created by the burst emission process itself, or it could be imparted by the intervening plasma near the source. Their observations showed that FRB 121102 is almost 100% polarised. One of the scientists involved in the study, Dr Charlotte Sobey from Curtin University in the CSIRO, says the amount of twisting observed in the burst seemed to vary by at least 10% over several months. The behaviour of this polarised light allowed Sobey and colleagues to probe the source's environment in new ways and peer into the layer of this mysterious burster. As polarised radio waves travel through a region with a magnetic field, the polarisation gets twisted by an effect known as Faraday rotation and the stronger the magnetic field, the greater the twisting. And that's important because the amount of twisting observed in this fast radio burst is among the largest ever measured for any radio source. The authors think the bursts are passing through an exceptionally strong magnetic field in a dense plasma. Now, the only known sources in our galaxy which are twisted as much as FRB 121102 are at the galactic centre, which is a dynamic region near a supermassive black hole. And maybe this fast radio burst is in a similar environment in its host galaxy. However, the twisting of the radio burst could also be explained if the source is located in a powerful nebula or a supernova remnant. Sobe says detecting the bursts at higher radio frequencies than ever before has enabled scientists to measure the immense amount of twisting imparted on the source's considerably polarised light by the extreme environment within the galaxy. Fast 
radio bursts, or FRBs, are a recently discovered type of cosmic signal originating from deep in extragalactic space. They're short, sharp flashes of light, bursts of radio waves lasting just fractions of a second. They're intrinsically very bright because they're coming from galaxies outside of our own, and they're usually kind of one-off flash-in-the-pan signals. But this particular FRB, 121102, is different from the others that we've seen so far because it seems to be repeating. If they were all flash in the pan signals, that would tell us something about how they're produced. You've got to be thinking of things like supernovae. But then this particular FRB comes into the picture and it blows that theory to pieces because it couldn't have been made that way because whatever's causing it, it's repeating. It's doing it over and over again. Yeah, that's right. So if, if a signal happens one time, you might associate it with a cataclysmic event or a kind of explosion. Yeah, b- because this particular FRB is repeating, it kind of rules out those theories that associate FRBs with cataclysmic events or kind of one-off events like yeah. an explosion. Of course, there could be more than one type of FRB too. That's what we found out with gamma ray bursts, wasn't it? There were more than one type. Yeah, that's right. And there's been a lot of parallels actually drawn between astronomers investigating what the GRBs are and now, obviously, the FRBs. And, yeah, it could be the case that there's different types of FRBs, but those investigations, obviously, are still ongoing and still following up the other fast radio burst locations, just in case. They wink back. (laughs) They wink back. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So with this particular FRB, about a year ago, uh, astronomers were able to narrow down its approximate place in the sky, and that was very telling, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. So because this source repeats, it's an excellent way for us to further investigate where this FRB comes from. So it looks like it's located at a site of intense star formation within a dwarf galaxy, which is a galaxy much less massive than our own Milky Way. And this small galaxy is about 3 billion light years away, so pretty far away. So this burst has to be pretty bright for us to detect it. In terms of its environment, there's two kind of leading theories. One is that it's in the vicinity of a massive black hole. And the kind of motivation behind this theory is that the only sources that we've seen with such extreme twisting of the light or Faraday rotation are sources towards the centre of our own galaxy. So sources near Sagittarius A star, which is the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy. So that's kind of the motivation behind that idea, because it has to be in kind of an extreme environment with a high magnetic field. And that kind of environment can be close to supermassive black holes. The other theory is that because it's in this area of intense star formation associated with stars being born and stars dying in supernova explosions is that this could be a very young source within an extremely powerful nebula. So that's kind of the two leading theories at the minute. Can we tell by the Faraday twisting whether or not the twisting must be occurring near the point of emission or whether it could be anywhere in space between the source and us? So the signal that we get is basically integrated along the line of sight between the source and us. So this twisting can occur anywhere between the source and the Earth. However, we think that because there's such an immense amount of twisting that the extreme magnetic field is probably associated with the region close to the source of these fast radio bursts. We know the Faraday rotation or the twisting that we expect from the galaxy, and that's actually in the opposite direction to the signal that we detect from this fast radio burst. So we know that it's definitely coming from, the signal's definitely coming from outside of our own galaxy, and because of this obviously immense immense amount of twisting, it's highly likely that it's associated with the region around the source embedded within this dwarf galaxy. What we also think is kind of yeah another point towards that theory is that the amount of twisting or Faraday rotation seems to be changing on the time scale of a few months. So that also leads us to suggest that that will probably be related to the, the intense magnetic field surrounding the source rather than anything else along the line of sight, either within our galaxy or between our galaxy and this dwarf galaxy. What about things like magnetars? They'd be too small, I take it, in terms of the effect they're likely to have? So our kind of leading theory at the minute as to what could be producing these fast radio bursts is actually a kind of neutron star called a pulsar or a magnetar, um, which has an extremely high magnetic field. 
And magnetars are young, particularly young pulsars. They have an extremely high magnetic field and often produce light that's highly polarised, which is also similar to what we see in these fast radio bursts. So that's kind of one theory as to what the source of these bursts could be, a kind of neutron star, basically. That's Dr Charlotte Sobe from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research and the CSIRO. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a quick break from the program so I can tell you about our new deal. We have a great offer for listeners of Space Time. Audible's offering a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial. There's a massive range to choose from, including bestsellers such as Breaking the Chains of Gravity. That's the story of spaceflight before NASA. And there's Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And Endurance, A Year in Space, a lifetime of discovery by astronaut Scott Kelly as he documents his record-breaking achievements aboard the International Space Station. So many great books, no matter what your taste. In fact, over 180,000 titles to choose from. And there's no need to rush. Not only do we give you a free book, but you can have a 30-day free trial to browse to your heart's content. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash spacetime. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com or in the show notes. And now, it's back to the program. New images have revealed eight sites on Mars where thick subsurface deposits of water ice have been exposed on the cliff faces of eroding slopes. As well as holding clues about the red planet's climate history, the findings reported in the journal Science also show how frozen water may be far more accessible for future missions to Mars than previously thought. The eight scarps, with slopes as steep as 55 degrees, are revealing new information about the internal layered structure of previously detected underground ice sheets in the red planet's mid-latitudes. Some of these exposed ice layers are more than 100 metres thick. The sites were detected in both the Martian northern and southern hemispheres at latitudes ranging from 55 to 58 degrees. Now that's the equivalent of Scotland or the tip of South America here on Earth. The ice was likely deposited long ago as snow. The deposits are exposed in cross-section as relatively pure water ice, capped by a layer 1 to 2 metres thick of ice-cemented rock and dust. This exposed ice preserves evidence of long-term patterns in Martian climate. You see, the tilt of the Martian axis of rotation varies much more than Earth's does over rhythms of millions of years. Today, the two planets' tilts are both about the same, roughly 23 degrees. But when Mars tilts more, climatic conditions will change, favouring a build-up of middle-latitude ice. The banding in the colour variations, apparent in some of the scarps, suggest layers possibly deposited with changes in the proportion of ice and dust under differing climatic conditions. The study's lead author, Colin Dundas from the US Geological Survey in Flagstaff, Arizona, says there's shallow ground ice under roughly a third of the Martian surface, which records the recent history of the Red Planet. These new images are cross-sections through the ice, which provide scientists with three-dimensional views in more detail than ever before. The ice layers were detected by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, HiRISE. The scarps directly expose bright glimpses into vast underground ice, previously detected with ground-penetrating radar instruments on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as spectrometers on NASA's Mars Odyssey spacecraft and instruments by the European Space Agency's Mars Express Orbiter and through direct observations of fresh impact craters which have uncovered and exposed subsurface ice. In fact, NASA sent the Phoenix lander to Mars in direct response to the Odyssey findings in 2008. The Phoenix mission was able to confirm and analyse the buried water ice at 68 degrees north latitude. That's about a third of the way to the Martian North Pole from the northernmost of the eight scarp sites. The study's co-author, Shane Byrne from the University of Arizona in Tucson, says the discovery is providing scientists with new windows, allowing them to see right into these thick underground sheets of ice. Scientists haven't yet determined exactly how these specific scarps initially formed. However, once the buried ice becomes exposed to the Martian atmosphere, a scarp likely grows wider and taller as it retreats due to sublimation of the ice directly from a solid form into water vapour. Examination of some of these scarps confirmed that the bright material is indeed frozen water. 
Previous observations mapping the extensive underground water ice sheets at mid-latitudes of Mars had already established that the top of the ice is less than 10 metres beneath the surface. And the new ice scarp studies confirm indications from fresh crater and neutron spectrometer observations that the layer rich in water ice begins just one or two metres below the surface. The new study not only suggests that underground water ice lies within a thin covering over a wide area of Mars, it also identifies eight sites where this ice is directly accessible at latitudes with less hostile conditions than at the Martian polar ice caps. What it means is that future astronauts to Mars will essentially be able to just go there with a bucket and spade and get all the water they need for drinking, for making oxygen and power and for making rocket fuel. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered an excess of massive stars being formed in a giant stellar nursery in our neighbouring galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. The findings, reported in the journal Science, are based on observations of 30 Doradas, better known as the Tarantula Nebula. It's the biggest star-forming region in our part of the universe and hosts to some of the most massive stars ever found. The discovery of so many high-mass stars just 163,000 light-years away has far-reaching consequences for science's understanding of how stars transformed the universe over the past 13.8 billion years. You see, massive stars are especially important because of their enormous influence on their surroundings. And when they die, they form some of the most exotic objects in the universe, neutron stars and black holes. Other than the hydrogen and helium produced in the Big Bang, These high-mass stars produce pretty much all the elements on the periodic table, either during their lifetimes or when they die and explode as supernovae. That material is then spread through the interstellar medium, providing the building blocks for new generations of stars and the planetary systems which form around them. During their lives, massive stars produce copious amounts of ionising radiation. They also produce kinetic energy through strong stellar winds, and combined both these processes help drive galactic evolution. Also, high-mass stars were the first stars to form in the very early universe. They ionised the cosmos, and in the process took the universe out of the cosmic dark ages and into what's known as the Epoch of Reionization, which made the universe transparent and look the way it does today. The lead author of this study, Fabian Schneider from Oxford University, says he was astonished to find 30 Doradus had formed such an overabundance of massive stars. The findings suggest that most of the stellar mass in the universe is actually no longer in low-mass stars, but a significant fraction is in high-mass stars. The authors reached their conclusions through the detailed analysis of 250 stars, each between 15 and 200 times the mass of our Sun. That allowed them to determine the distribution of massive stars born in 30 Doradus, a figure known as the initial mass function. The initial mass function predicts that most stellar masses is in low-mass stars and that less than 1% of all stars are born with masses in excess of 10 times that of the Sun. The authors weren't only surprised by the sheer number of massive stars, but also the size of some of these stars. They found 30% more stars than predicted that were at least 30 times or more the Sun's mass. And at least 73% more stars than predicted at least 60 times the mass of the Sun. Also, until recently, the existence in the modern universe of stars up to 200 solar masses was highly disputed. But this study shows that stars of between 200 and 300 solar masses is highly likely, and that's at least twice the previously accepted upper limit. It's important because in most parts of the universe it was always thought that stars tend to become rarer the more massive they are. Big stars also burn through their fuel really quickly. It means they're the James Deans of the universe, living fast and dying young. That means we should be seeing far more supernovae than predicted, which in turn means more neutron stars and at least three times more stellar mass black holes. Schneider says it could mean there could be up to 70% more supernovae, a tripling of chemical yields 
and towards four times the ionising radiation from massive star populations. The study was part of the VLT Flames Tarantula Survey, which uses the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope, or VLT, to study nearly a thousand massive stars in the stellar nursery. Measuring the population of massive stars is extremely difficult, primarily because of their scarcity and because there are only a handful of places in the local universe where this can be done. The large sample in 30 Doradus allowed scientists to derive the most accurate high mass segment of the initial mass function to date, in the process showing that massive stars are far more abundant than previously thought. To quantitatively understand all the feedback mechanisms involved in both stellar and galactic evolution, and hence the role massive stars play in the universe, astronomers need to know how many of these behemoth stars are born. The research still leaves open many questions, including just how universal these findings really are. And of course, what are the consequences of all this for the evolution of the universe? This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. New research has supported earlier studies indicating strange and even sporadic variations in the light coming from a distant star is most likely nothing more than dust. Over the last few years, astronomers and the general public have been captivated by the mysterious changes in brightness coming from the star now commonly referred to as Tabby Star. The star, officially called KIC 8462852, is located some 1,280 light years away in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. It was nicknamed Tabby Star after Louisiana State University astronomer Tabitha Boygen, who first noticed the strange brightness fluctuations in data on the star collected by NASA's planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope. Kepler finds exoplanets, that is planets orbiting stars other than the Sun, by looking for changes in the brightness of distant stars caused by a planet passing in front of or transiting its host star as seen from Kepler's perspective. KIC 8462852 is a typical spectral type F main sequence yellow star, about 50% bigger and 1000 degrees hotter than the Sun. However, it's been dimming and brightening sporadically like no other star ever seen. The star would dim, flicker and then brighten by between 5 and 22% over time scales of days, months or even just a few years with no obvious pattern in any of the light curves. As well as the idea of obscuring clouds of gas and dust, numerous other hypotheses have been put forward to try and explain the unusual observations. One idea suggested that the star's light was being sporadically obscured by a cloud of disintegrating comets orbiting the star elliptically. Another suggested Tabby stars far younger than it looks and it's still coalescing material around it. Then there's the planetary collision hypothesis, which suggested that the light fluctuations were being caused by debris from a massive planetary collision or breakup. Other ideas range from large planets with oscillating rings to planets with swarms of Trojan asteroids. Alternatively, some hypotheses suggest that stellar processes within the star itself could be to blame, such as geomagnetic storms caused by star spot activity, differential rotation hiccups, changes in the distribution of the photosphere, random variations in convective efficiency, or non-equilibrium chaotic variations caused by avalanche statistics occurring when a star is in phase transition and near criticality. However, it was an off-the-cuff remark by an astronomer in 2015 which really sparked attention when it was jokingly said that the changes in brightness could even be caused by a giant Dyson sphere, a hypothetical alien megastructure surrounding the star designed to soak up as much energy from the star as possible in order to power an advanced alien civilization. The mystery of Tabby's star was so compelling, more than 1,700 people donated over $100,000 through a Kickstarter campaign in support of dedicated ground-based telescope time to observe and gather more data on the star through a network of telescopes around the world. It allowed scientists to observe the star through the Las Cámaras Observatory from March 2016 through to December 2017. Beginning in May 2017, astronomers detected four distinct episodes when the star's light suddenly dipped. The data, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, confirms that different colours of light from the star are being blocked at different intensities. Now, had they all changed at nearly the same time, it would suggest the cause was something opaque, like an orbiting disk, a planet or a star, or even a large alien megastructure like a Dyson sphere. But instead, the star becomes much dimmer at some specific wavelengths compared to others, and the most likely reason for that would be dust particles. You're listening to Space Time. 
I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. 2017 was Australia's third hottest year on record, according to new figures released by the Bureau of Meteorology. It was also the hottest year since records began in the states of New South Wales and Queensland. The Weather Bureau says temperatures across Australia were 0.95 degrees higher than the long-term average. The new results are consistent with global warming predictions. The figures provided by the Bureau's annual climate statement also show that the main climate drivers, the Indian Ocean Dipole and the El Nino Southern Oscillation, were both in neutral for much of the year. Seven of the ten warmest years on record have been recorded since 2005. In fact, earlier this month, Sydney's western suburbs were confirmed as the hottest place on Earth for that day, when temperatures reached 47.3 degrees Celsius. And the hot conditions go far beyond land surface, with new records set for warm ocean temperatures causing another mass coral bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. In fact, this is the first time the reef's been hit by mass coral bleaching two years in a row. 2017 was a year of extremes. While the nation had 8% more rain than average, most of that fell in the isolated northwest, while the heavily populated southeast of the continent suffered unusually dry conditions. In fact, September was the driest on record for New South Wales and the Murray-Darling Basin, consistent with a growing decline in rainfall of up to 20% during that time of year. A new study warns that ibuprofen painkillers can directly affect male fertility. The findings, reported in the journal PNAS, are based on 31 male participants aged 18 to 35. Researchers found that ibuprofen administration resulted in the development of compensated hypogonadism, a clinical condition that affects reproductive health in men. Using testes explants and a human steroidogenic cell line, the authors found that ibuprofen modified hormonal cell lines through selective transcriptional repression of testicular endocrine cells and induced a state of compensated hypogonadism. A study led by the Murdoch Children's Research Institute has found probiotic lactobacillus ruteri has the potential to provide some reduction in crying in breastfed babies less than three months old. The findings were put in the journal Pediatrics could mean a more restful night for baby and more sleep for parents. Up until now, there's been no effective treatment for colic. Colic affects one in five families. It's associated with maternal depression, early breastfeeding cessation, and in extreme cases leads to child abuse, such as shaken baby syndrome. Scientists have finally proved something women have always known. Baby brain is real. A study reported in the Medical Journal of Australia has found that baby brain, the pregnancy-induced haze of forgetfulness reported by many women, really does exist and is both measurable and significant. Researchers analysed 20 previous studies and found that overall cognitive functioning was poorer in pregnant women than non-pregnant women. But on the plus side, they also found that the reductions in performance were small, along the lines of forgetting a medical appointment, and would likely only be noticed by pregnant women themselves and perhaps those closest to them. And joining us now on Space Time's an old friend from the days of ABC Star Stuff, technology journalist Alex saharov Royt is joining us from CES in Las Vegas, the world's largest consumer electronics show. It's tech heaven. It's Disneyland for technology. The problem with the event is it's so big. It's, there's so much stuff here that it's impossible to see at all. I mean, really, the event should be on for two weeks or three weeks. You, you have time. This is like geek nirvana, I take it. Everything is here. I mean, there's artificial intelligence. There's robots. There's augmented reality, virtual reality. There's cars, there's digital assistance, anything you can think of, and plenty of stuff that you didn't even know you needed. When we spoke with you last, and that was quite a while ago, back in the days of Star Stuff on ABC News Radio, you were telling us then about something called convergence, where different types of products, such as camcorders, iPods, and cell phones, would all eventually amalgamate into a simple product. Of course, that's exactly what happened. We've now got smartphones. What's the big thing coming up now? Well, all that technology is getting smarter. 
that. So with artificial intelligence, instead of having to look at your phone, you can just speak to Google Home or the Alexa or the Siri, Siri. smart speaker. Yeah, that's, I mean, you can speak to you. You can already do many of these things with your phone, but often when you talk to your phone and ask it questions, it only responds to you half of the time. The other half of the time, it sort of makes you look at the phone. But already there are many people who are using the smart speakers to turn their whole homes into smart homes so they can say things like good night or turn out the lights and all the smart locks will lock, the shades will automatically close, any electrical devices that are on will turn off or go to sleep mode. You can even have Wi-Fi networks can you know switch off so that the kids can't be in their rooms trying to surf the net when they're supposed to be sleeping. Also, that you've got the smartphones that we have today. These, and along with artificial intelligence, these are the brains of the robots of tomorrow. Where's it going? Is it Are we talking about technology to make our lives easier or are we talking about technology to introduce new things? It's a bit of both because see, a technology has become uh, really successful when it becomes in, invisible to our lives. We don't have to think yeah. twice about it anymore. For a lot of people, they just use their phones without thinking. I mean, they're glued to them. And yet there are still seniors out there or other people that just they just want their dumb phone, their little standard phone with buttons because they just don't want to have to deal with that side of life. Now, I often say that science fiction is uh, a warning to humanity not to let those dystopian futures emerge. You know, make sure there's a kill switch. But Alex, you know as well as I do, Big Brother's here already. Everything 1984 promised us has arrived. We may not see it, it may be hidden, but it's there. Well, that's true. That's absolutely true. Really, it comes down to knowledge. I mean, knowledge is power, and if you know how to use technology and use it to your advantage, then your life is going to be easier. Despite whatever governments and companies that are trading away our privacy for some free app are doing, you know, we are still the consumers of this technology, and we need to be telling governments and companies that, hey, we don't want our privacy to be besmirched, and we're still in this phase where, you know, we're trying to work it all out. What was the thing that excited you the most? One cool gadget that many people could see themselves buying right now, it's a strip that sits on top of any standard 88 key keyboard, and it lights up red dots for your right hand, blue dots for your left hand. It pairs with a tablet by Bluetooth that has virtually any song you could think of, all with the score there, and it teaches you how to play with real piano lessons and uh, also gamified lessons where, you know, it's like playing Guitar Hero. You have to hit the right keys to, yeah. to make things ha- appear on the screen, and that actually might make piano lessons for you or your kids fun rather than a chore. Another gadget was a smart mirror that uh, lit up on the sides. It's like a, a, for women or guys that want to do that sort of thing, put makeup on, and it had all these different programs to teach you how to apply different styles of makeup. You could have virtual makeup applied to your face so you could see what it would be like. And it was also used as a sort of a pseudo-medical tool to be able to analyze your face and how skin is aging or spots that might appear. And you can track all of this. Another gadget was a mannequin that could expand and shrink as required after taking digital scans of your body so that you could have clothing made precisely for your body shape without you having to physically be there. And uh, according to the people that I spoke to, the fashion houses of Paris and around the world are already very course, interested yes. in this device. There was also a Samsung and announcing a new television. Now, there's a technology called OLED, which is organic light-emitting diode. LG are using that now, aren't they? That's right. Samsung has had a thing called quantum dot technology, but they have this new thing called micro-LED, which they say are much smaller than the current LEDs, light-emitting diodes in today's televisions. That TV is 146 inches. It's called The Wall. That's The Wall. And I'm sure you know, that's The Wall. And they also showed off a television which will come later this year. It's using the more standard QLED, quantum dot technology, but they are able to upscale 4K television to 8K Now, 4K was four times the resolution of full HD, the 1080p televisions that most people have. The next step is going to be 8K, and this is twice the resolution of 4K. And because, you know, there's no 8K recordings being done now, they have to upscale this. And upscaling used to be like taking a a low-res photo and zooming into it on your computer or phone. It sort of looked fuzzy. But, But nowadays, they're able to use this artificial intelligence to really make the picture sharp and really give it this extra resolution, this effect of looking even sharper than it currently. And so if you only recently bought a 4K TV, guess what? It's already out of date. That's Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire, proving that when Alex is around, what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in Vegas. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary. At Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Today's episode of Space Time was brought to you by Audible.com. Help support the show and get your first book for free plus a 30-day free trial. Use the link www.audibletrial.com slash spacetime. That's www.audibletrial.com slash spacetime for your free audiobook.